Hello, my name is Robert Off, and I consider myself as an artist who creates miniature room boxes as an art form. I have made several videos demonstrating the creative process involved in making my room boxes, and as a result of those videos, I have often been asked by viewers if I would make museum-type display boxes for them to display their miniature furniture and other collectibles in. I've had to turn them down in the past because I don't have the time, and it's not what I do. However, I needed to make a few display boxes for myself to display my pieces of furniture in prior to using them in one of my room boxes. I thought that since I was making these display boxes for myself, that I would take a few photographs and create a how-to video of how I did it. Now with a few tools, a little effort, and a few dollars, you can make a beautiful museum quality display box like these for yourself. The acrylic box picture here was produced by Creative Acrylics. I ordered it in the exact thickness and exterior dimensions that I wanted. In this case, I ordered one which was one quarter of an inch thick and the other which was one eighth of an inch thick. The box maker, Creative Acrylics, contact information is found at the end of this video. Bruce does a great job and his prices are very reasonable. You will also need to purchase wood strips to create the random width flooring. The wood strip should be 1 16th of an inch thick, and the board width should be 1 inch, 3 quarters of an inch, and 1 fourth of an inch wide. These strips generally come in 1 or 2 foot lengths. I suggest using either bass, cherry, or walnut wood. However, bass wood is the most reasonably priced and the one that I use in this video. These specialty woods can be ordered pre-cut from a number of suppliers which are also listed at the end of this video. The display box shown here is an unfinished pre-cut wood base or plaque. They are inexpensive and readily available at Hobby Lobby or at Michaels. You might also want to purchase a pair of mitering scissors shown here in the lower right. They can also be purchased at a local hobby store or online from Micromart. The other items shown here can be picked up at your local hardware store. A sanding block, sanding paper, an exacto meter cuttering box with an accompanying saw, blue painters tape, and contact cement. The other items shown include a one quarter inch round trim which can be picked up at Home Depot or a local lumber yard. It generally comes in six foot lengths and will have to be cut with your miter box so that the four sides match up with the exterior corner measurements of the acrylic box. You will also need various stains. I particularly like using cherry and fruit, fruit wood colors, both of which are used in this video. I use shellac for the final finishing rather than polyurethane. I like shellac better because it does a wonderful job, isn't toxic, doesn't smell much, and is a natural product. You will need some sort of a drill. I use a Dremel drill fitted out with a 3 16th bit for pegging the floor and use 3 16th wooden dowels for the pegs. Additionally, a paintbrush and a box cutter are required. You will notice the square brown board this was cut with a saw to match the exact size of the floor that you want to produce inside the box. It should have the same footprint as the acrylic box itself. You will use this as a template as you create the actual floor. You can use any material for the template since it will not be used in the final product. However, it should be smooth and rigid. It will be used only as a template for making the floor. After you have used the miter box and cut the quarter round pieces, you should place them together on the wood base and place the items that you may want to display inside the box on it so that you can make sure that everything fits. Do not glue it yet. You must stain and shellac the individual pay pieces in the base prior to gluing. If you glue it together prior to staining and finishing, you run into the possibility that some of the glue will get on the raw wood, making it impossible to properly stain and finish later. Note the unglued quarter round pieces on the right of the photograph.
After you have stained and shellacked the base pieces, glue them together. Your floor template should fit precisely in the space allotted. If it does not, sand it down until it does. It must fit snugly, but not too tightly. Note that you should have a bit of wiggle room, which will be hidden by the width of the acrylic box, which will sit on top of it and cover it up. Place the floor template in front of you and firmly secure the bottom to the work surface using a piece of blue tape. Place one of the one inch floor strips, which you have cut into the width of the template, on the first row. Now secure the first row at the top of the template with another strip of blue tape. Make sure that the tape at the top and at the bottom of the template are secure and tight. I like to slightly sand the sides of each wood floor strip and the butt ends of each strip so that it will make for a more identified seams when everything is glued together. This is, however, a matter of personal preference. Continue placing the strips cut to various lengths on the template. Let your creativity go wild using whatever width and length of strip you like the looks of. After you have completed a few rows, secure them with more blue tape, making sure that they are tightly pushed together. You don't want any gaps between the boards. After you have completed the floor, cut the template away from the table. Remove the template and, the, and trim the ends of the tape floor so that you have a clean taped floor as shown here. The next step is to make sure the floor fits on into the designated space on your finished base. Assuming it does without further trimming, apply contact cement to both the designated space on the base and onto the underside of your floor shown here. This should be done outside or in a well ventilated place because contact cement is very toxic. Allow 20 minutes for the cement to dry. Then place the glue sided tape boards onto the glue sided side of the base. Important, this is tricky. You must be careful to get everything exactly lined up and make sure the placement is correct the first time because the contact cement will bond almost instantly. Press the newly glued floor onto the base. It will be fully affixed almost immediately. Next, remove the blue tape. This should be done as soon as possible, so as not to damage the surface of the wood floor by its removing. If you want your floor to be pegged, you must drill holes in the individual boards where you would like them. I use a 3 16th drill bit and a 3 16th dowel for the pegs. If you want your pegs to be larger, simply use the corresponding drill bit and dowel. After you have drilled the hole, place the end of the dowel in it and snip off the end with some shears, as shown here. Do not be concerned about gluing the pegs in. They will be held in by, the, by friction and with the stain and shellac finishing, which will be applied later. After all the pegs have been put in place, the entire floor must be sanded. This can be completed by either using an electric sander, as I have done here, or by hand. Both work well. The electric sander is obviously much faster. Once everything is sanded and smooth, remove all the dust and grime from the surface prior to staining and finishing with shellac. I have found that allowing the stain to dry overnight is preferable prior to final finishing. When the floor is fully dry, I apply two coats of shellac to the floor, allowing it to dry between coats. Once the two coats are dry, I gently rub it smooth using a fine quality steel wool. This will smooth out the ridges which have formed from the shellac and make the surface smooth for your final coats. The shellac is thinned with denatured alcohol rather than turpentine. I then continue to use coats of shellac and steel wool until the finish I am seeking is achieved. Generally I have found another one or two coats work well. I like to thin the final coat of the shellac with more alcohol in order to make it thinner, and during the final coat I shellac the entire base and the floor, thus ensuring a consistent finish all around. 
you will find that the floor dries almost instantly. These are what your final bases should look like. The upper base, I've used the fruit wood stain, and for the smaller base at the bottom, I've used the cherry stain. Both look very similar, however you will note that the cherry base is a bit redder. You can now place your creative acrylic box on top of your newly finished base. You have now made a museum quality display box for your miniature furniture and other collectibles. Sometimes I like to create a backdrop for my collections. To do this, I simply create a wall using a piece of painted wood adorned with moldings, wallpaper, art, etc., and glue it to the interior of the back side of the acrylic box. When you apply the glue, put droplets on the acrylic and make sure that it is not too close to the edge. I use regular Elmer's glue, one drop in the center, and four drops around the edges. Place the backdrop on the acrylic and wait 24 hours before handling. You want a good bond and nothing moving around. This is an example of the finished product. Backdrop in place with my two designer chairs and a reproduction Mondrian painting and a small brass plate explaining what everything is. This is a more completed vignette I made for my son for his wedding gift. As you can see, it is larger and a much more complete scene. These boxes are easy to make, not too expensive to build, fun to have around the house. They also make one-of-a-kind gifts. Thanks for watching.